you can work on micro habits with regards to your conscientiousness. And I think the best micro habits, and this is partly to do with this future authoring program processes, I think the best thing you can do with regards to your conscientiousness is to set up some aims for yourself, goals that you actually value. And the future authoring program helps people do that. And basically, it does a, a situational analysis of, it helps you do a situational analysis of your life more than a psychological analysis, I would say. And so, so the questions are something like, well, all right, you're going to have to put some effort into your life. And you need to be motivated to do that. And so what are the potential sources of motivation? Well, you could think about them in, in the big five manner. You know, if you're extroverted, you want friends. If you're agreeable, you want an intimate relationship. If you're disagreeable, you want to win competitions. If you're open, you want to engage in creative activity. If you're high in eroticism, you want security. Okay, so those are all sources of potential motivation that you could draw on, that you could tailor to your own, you know, your own personality. But then there are dimensions that you want to consider your life across. And so we ask people about, well, you know, if you could have your life the way you wanted it in three to five years, if you were taking care of yourself properly, you know, what would you want from your friendships? What would you want from your intimate relationship? How would you like to structure your family? What do you want for your career? Well, how are you going to use your time outside of your job? And how are you going to regulate your mental, physical, mental and physical health? And maybe also your drug and alcohol use, because that's, that's a good place to auger down, you know, because alcoholism, for example, wipes out, you know, five to 10% of people. So you want to keep that under control and then and then so maybe you know you 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 develop a vision of what your life what you would like your life to be and that associates the so the goal well, once the goal is established and then you break down the goal into micro processes that you can implement the micro processes become rewarding in proportion in relation to their uh, causal association with the goal and that tangles in your your incentive reward system you know we talked about the dopaminergic incentive reward system and that's the thing that keeps you moving forward and the way it works is that it works better if it produces positive emotion when it can see you moving towards a valued goal okay well what's the implication of that better have a valued goal because otherwise you can't get any positive motivation working out and so the more valuable the goal in principle the more the micro processes associated with that goal start to take on a positive charge and so what that means is, well, you get up in the morning and you're excited to, about the day, you're ready to go. And so as far as I can tell, what you do is you specify your long-term ideal. Maybe you also specify a place you want to stay the hell away from so that you're terrified to fail as well as excited about succeeding, because that's also useful. You specify your goal, you, you do that, you do that in some sense as a unique individual, you want to, you want to specify goals that make you say, oh, if that could happen as a consequence of my efforts, it would clearly be worthwhile. Because the question always is, why do something? Because doing nothing is easy. You just sit there and you don't do anything. That's real easy. The question is, why would you ever do anything? And the answer to that has to be because you've determined by some means that it's worthwhile. And then the next question might be, well, where should you look for worthwhile things? And one would be, well, you could consult your own temperament. And the other would be, well, you kind of look at how Look at what it is that people accrue that's valuable across the lifespan. Look, look what, so you do a structural analysis of the subcomponents of human existence and I already did that. You need a family, you need friends. Like you don't need to have all these things, but you better have most of them. Family, friends, career, educational goals, plans for, you know, time outside of work, uh, attention to your mental and physical health, etc. You know, those are, that's what life is about. And if you don't have any of those things well then all you've got left is misery and suffering so that's that's a bad that's a bad deal for you so so once you but once you set up that that goal structure let's say and that's really in many in many ways that's what you should be doing at university is, is that's exactly what you should be doing is trying to figure out who it is that you're trying to be right and you, you, you aim at that and then you use everything you learn as a means of building that person that you want to be and and I really mean want to be I don't mean should be even those things those things are going to overlap and it's important to distinguish between those because that's partly and this is back down to the micro routine analysis so if I was saying well you're going to try to make yourself more industrious okay number one specify your damn goals because how are you going to hit something if you don't know what it is that isn't going to happen and often people won't specify their goals too because they don't like to specify conditions for failure so if you keep yourself all vague and foggy 
which is real easy, because that's just a matter of not doing as well, then you don't know when you fail. And people might say, well, I really don't want to know when I fail because that's painful. And so I'll, I'll keep myself blind about when I fail. That's fine, except you'll fail all the time then. You just won't know it until you've failed so badly that you're done. And that can easily happen by the time you're 40. So, so I would recommend that you don't let that happen. So that's willful blindness, right? You could have known, but you chose not to. Okay, so once you get your goal structure set up, you think, okay, if I could have this life, looks like that might be worth living, despite the fact that it's gonna be, you know, anxiety provoking and threatening, and there's gonna be some suffering and loss involved and all of that, obviously. The goal is to, to have a vision for your life such that all things considered, that justifies your effort. Okay, so then what do you do? Well, then, then you turn down to the micro routines. It's like, okay, well, this is what I'm aiming for. How does that instantiate itself day to day, week to week, month to month? And that's where something like a schedule can be unbelievably useful. Google Calendar. It's like, make a damn schedule and stick to it. Okay, so what's the rule with the schedule? It's not a bloody prison. That's the first thing that people do wrong. They say, well, I don't like to have, follow a schedule. It's like, well, what kind of schedule are you setting up? Well, I, sh I have to do this, then I have to do this, then I have to do this, you know, and then I just go play video games because who wants to do all these things that I have to do? It's like, wrong. Set the damn schedule up so that you have the day you want. That's the trick. It's like, okay, I've got tomorrow. If I was gonna set it up so it was the best possible day I could have, practically speaking, what would it look like? Well, then you schedule that. And obviously there's a bit of responsibility that's gonna go along with that because if you have any sense, one of the things that you're gonna insist upon is that at the end of the day, you're not in worse shape than you were that, than at the beginning of the day, right? Because that's a stupid day. If you have a bunch of those in a row, you just dig, you know, you dig yourself a hole and then you bury yourself in it. It's like, sorry, that's just not a good strategy. It's a bad strategy. So maybe 20% of your day has to be responsibility and obligation, or maybe it's more than that, depending on how far behind you are. But even that, you can, you can ask yourself, okay, well, I've got these responsibilities. I have to schedule the damn things in. What's the right ratio of responsibility to reward? And you can ask yourself that just like you'd negotiate with someone who is working for you. It's like, okay, you got to work tomorrow. Okay, so I want you to work tomorrow. And you might say, okay, well, what are you going to do for me that makes it likely that I'll work for you? Well, you could ask yourself that, you know. So maybe you do an hour of, of responsibility and then you play a video game for 15 minutes. I don't know, whatever turns your crank, man. But, you know, you have to negotiate with yourself and not tyrannize yourself like you're negotiating with someone that you care for, that you would like to be productive and have a good life. And, and that's how you make the schedule. It's like, and then you look at the day and you think, well, if I had that day, that'd be good. Great. You know, and you, you're useless and horrible, so you'll probably only hit it with about 70% accuracy, but that beats the hell out of zero, right? And if you hit it even with 50% accuracy, another rule is, well, aim for 51% the next week or 50 and a half percent for God's sake, or because, you're, you're going to hit that position where things start to loop back positively and spiral you upward. And so, so that's one way that you can work on your conscientiousness is plan a life you'd like to have. And, and you do that partly by referring to social norms. That's more or less rescuing your father from the belly of the whale. But the way, other way you do that is by having a little conversation with yourself about as if you don't really know who you are, because you know what you're like. You won't do what you're told. You won't do what you tell yourself to do. You must have noticed that. It's like you're a bad employee and a worse boss. And both of those work, you know, for you. You don't know what you want to do. And then when you tell yourself what to do, you don't do it anyways. You should fire yourself and find someone else to be. It's painful to understand how much of what you're doing isn't productive. So I'll give you an example. So. I've done this a couple of times with classrooms full of students. Usually when I'm lecturing about career development, say, okay, um, how much time do you waste? So then I, I get the class to vote. How many of you waste uh, 10 hours a day? It's like 10% of the kids will put up their hands. And it's interesting because I don't define what constitutes waste. I just ask the question. So they're diagnosing themselves, right? right? I'm not saying you're wasting 10 hours a day. I'm just asking. It's like, given your own attitude, how much time are you wasting? 10 hours a day, it's like 10% of the people put up their hands. Well, when you get to like six hours a day, 80% of the people put up their hands. 
So then we do the arithmetic. It's like, because I like doing arithmetic with people. People hate arithmetic, but I like doing it. It's like, okay, six hours a day. It's 42 hours a week. So let's call that a work week, 40 hours a week. So, so that's, that's a work week. Let's say, what's your time worth? You're a university student. Well, it's certainly worth minimum wage, because obviously, but it's worth way more than that, because if you spend a productive hour when you're 20, then you gain the benefits of that hour for the rest of your life. So there's the compounding effect of time spent when we were young. So I say, well, let's assume your time's worth 50 bucks an hour, which I think is an underestimate, but whatever, let's call it 50. We call it 25, but we'll call it 50. If that's $2,000 a week you're wasting. It's $100,000 a year. It's like, how much better would your life be if you weren't wasting $100,000 a year? It's like, what is that over 40 years? $4 million. It's like, you're rich. You don't even know it. Quit wasting time. By your own definition. It's like people shake their heads. Like, oh, I never thought about it that way. It's like, yeah, think about it that way. Don't waste your damn life. And, and then you think, well, why would people be resistant to that message? It's like, well, you really want to wake up and figure out that you're wasting half your life? And you know, when people do that kind of wasting, they actually hate it. You know, and I've had lots of people come to my clinical practice who were chronic procrastinators. You know, and so they're watching YouTube videos say, but, but not ones that are good for them, although sometimes they will do that, but just browsing in that kind of mindless way that you do when you're not paying attention and you're trying to kill time. And people doing that, they feel bad, they get depressed, they feel anxious, they can't get away from it, they feel kind of quasi-addicted. That's or they what they're do saying it. about social media yeah. now, it's yeah. a huge sure. issue with young kids. Absolutely, but there's this feeling of kind of internal rot and corruption yes. that goes along with it. It's like, yeah, well, you're wasting your life. It's like, so it's painful. It's painful to recognize that. Then it's painful to think, oh my God, look how undisciplined I am. I don't know anything. I can't use a schedule. I can't, I can't stick to a calendar. I don't have any aims. I don't know anything about the world, right? And maybe there's a part of me that's bitter because I, I haven't got everything already. And I'd like, just like to say to hell with it. That's the recognition of the Jungian shadow. It's like, that's what makes you vicious and, 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 and untrustworthy, all of that. No one wants to look at that and no bloody wonder. But hey, the alternative is worse.